There are many technologies that change the way people live, but only a rare few that change the way the world at large actually works. The reason is simple. Geography is static. Only a precious few technologies fundamentally alter how peoples interact with their geography. Either you have a river and can trade locally and cheaply and build your regional identity and capital base, or you don't, and you remain unaffiliated and poor. Either you live in the mountains and are isolated from others culturally and militarily and have an independent streak, or you're part of the ebb and flow and rise and fall of empires. In the main, these are the ways that geography has shaped human experience. But there are a few technological packages that have been so successful and far-reaching in their implementation that they have changed the rules of how peoples and nations interact. These few packages have come to define the age of the day. As you may have guessed from the previous chapter, sedentary agriculture makes the short list of transformative technologies. Irrigation and crop differentiation took humans from the hunter-gatherer lifestyle to modifying the land itself in order to produce greater concentrations of what humans wanted on time schedules that were sufficiently reliable to allow for settlement. Once crop cycles were hammered out, Populations could grow and provide spare labor to build roads, walls, buildings, and everything else that makes civilization worthy of the name. Beginning around 6000 BC, the secrets of agriculture radiated outward from places like Egypt and Mesopotamia, and their adoption created the groundswell of civilizations, interactions, and competitions of the ancient world. Many of the technologies developed over the course of the first five millennia allowed humans to improve upon agriculture but none resulted in the fundamental shift in circumstance that agriculture did. Copper and iron increased productivity as compared to wood and stone. Cannon and muskets increased range and lethality and required changes in battle tactics. The details, all of the details changed. But the core that stability and power came from a robust, secure, and sustainable food supply remained. It wasn't until the past half millennium that two packages of technologies, in sequence, radically altered the human condition. But before we launch into the first, it is critical to understand the shape of the world the day before the next transformative technology changed everything. The Ottoman Empire. The nearly superpower. Keep in mind the balance of transport. Moving stuff is hard, and moving stuff by water is easier than moving stuff by land. Successful countries tend to be those that boast robust options for maritime transport, but that maritime transport has to be of a fairly specific type. In the world before 1400, true ocean transport was a rare thing, being neither quick nor reliable nor safe. The problem was sight. Once line of sight to the land was lost, you had to more or less guess where you were and what heading might take you to where you needed to go and hope that you would make landfall before exhausting your supplies or before the weather turned and the sea swallowed you up. The need to keep land in sight sharply limited long-range voyages, as coastal peoples often had opinions about who would be allowed to sail along their coasts. In this era, nearly all of the major durable powers fell into one of two categories. The first were powers with navigable rivers that could easily extend their cultural reach up and down the river valley, enriching themselves with local trade, and use the resources of their larger footprint to protect themselves from, or force themselves upon, rivals. The second were powers that lived on seas sufficiently enclosed that they were difficult to get lost within. These seas didn't work quite as well as rivers but they certainly blunted the dangers of the open ocean and allowed for regional transport and trade. France, Poland, Russia, and a few of the Chinese empires fell into the first category, while the Swedes, Danes, Phoenicians, and Japanese fell into the second. In this pre-oceanic shipping era, one country nearly emerged as the European hegemon, largely because it qualified for both baskets and did so in a way bigger than other powers. The Ottoman Empire originated on the shores of the Sea of Marmara, a nearly enclosed sea small enough that it functioned as a river in terms of facilitating cultural unification, but large enough that it allowed for a reasonable volume of regional trade. And Marmara didn't exist in isolation. To its northeast was the Black Sea, while to its southwest lay the Aegean and the eastern Mediterranean, 
all three enclosed bodies of water that the Ottomans were able to use their naval acumen to dominate. Emptying into the western Black Sea was the Danube, by far Europe's largest river, which allowed the Ottomans to expand as far north into Europe as Vienna. By measures of the day, the Ottomans had within easy reach more useful land, river, and sea than any other power, and nearly more than all of their European rivals combined. And then there was trade. From their home base at the supremely well-positioned Istanbul, the Ottomans dominated all land and sea trade between Europe and Asia, and from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. The largest and most lucrative of those trade routes was the famous Silk Road, the source of all spices that made it to Europe. Pepper, ginger, cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, mace, cumin, and saffron might seem like minor luxuries today, but their only sources were in South and Southeast Asia. Between the unreliable nature of ocean transport and the yet-to-be-mapped African continent, there was no reliable all-water route. The only way to access Asian spices was for the Silk Road to traverse China, Central Asia, Persia, and ultimately Ottoman-controlled lands. Between the hundreds of middlemen, the sheer distances involved, and the hefty tax the Islamic Ottomans placed on spice transfers to Christian Europe, upper-class Europeans often spent as much on spices as they did on food. In a matter somewhat similar to that of contemporary Arab oil states, the spice trade perennially transferred massive volumes of wealth from Europe to the Turks. Benefiting from the most strategic location on the planet, Europe's longest river, three manageable seas, and the most profitable trade routes of the time, the Ottomans came but one battle away from dominating all of mainland Europe. In 1529, they laid siege to Vienna at the head of the Danube Valley. Had they won, they would have been able to pour an empire's worth of resources through the gap between the Alps and Carpathians onto the North European plain, a wide highway within which the Turks would have faced no barriers to conquest. But they failed, because the world had changed. Deepwater Navigation 1 Expanding the field. While the Turks were making their bid for hegemony in the 15th and 16th centuries, a technological revolution was altering how people and countries interacted not just with each other, but with their geography. Lands that languished in the old world began prospering in the new. The converse proved true as well. The new technologies transformed the Sea of Mamara from the richest and most secure topography on the planet to a backwater condemning the Ottoman Empire to a slow-motion collapse. Collectively, the new technologies ended ocean shipping's likelihood of being a near-death, or worse, experience. Compass, 14th century. Never underestimate the importance of being able to know which direction you are going. Extensive cloud cover plagues much of Western Europe and its surrounding seas, particularly from October to March. Being bereft of sun or stars while plying the English Channel, the Bay of Biscay, and the Mediterranean was a risky business, and so naval shipping tended to be seasonal to avoid cloudy skies and the uncertainty they generated. The compass made sunny days less a requirement and extended shipping seasons, for example, allowing Italian merchants to make two annual convoy trips to the Levantine coast to pick up spices rather than one. The initial design of the compass probably dates back to 11th century China, but it was not until the 14th century that the Europeans were able to develop a dry compass. Earlier versions floated a magnetized metal filament on water, making them impractical in anything but the mildest of seas. Cross Staff, 15th century. Once you know what direction you are going, you need to know where you are. A cross staff is a simple pole with a sliding crossbar that could be used to measure the angle between a known celestial object and the horizon, enabling its user to determine his latitude. A later version, the backstaff, 1594, allowed the same process without having to look at the object in question, which was often the eye-searing sun. In time, the technology evolved into the Mariner's Astrolabe and the Davis Quadrant. Combine the cross or backstaff with the compass, and captains could consult the wind speed and estimate their locations out of sight of land. Carvel Technique, 15th century. Dark Age vessels were constructed with a series of overlapping planks held together with pegs. The design was simple, 
but the ships were both heavy and difficult to repair, which drastically limited their speed, cargo capacity, and seaworthiness. The Carvel process instead laid down a frame of wooden ribs to which exterior planks were attached, eliminating pegs completely. The result was a ship design that was lighter, faster, safer, and easier to scale up. The scaling up proved particularly important for trade vessels. Now not only could they transport far larger cargoes, but their sides would also be high enough that even the waves of raging Atlantic storms could not crash onto their decks and founder them. The only downside was that the new technique required far more skill than the traditional peg or clinker vessels to craft. This drastically slowed its adoption, allowing those few nations that commanded the appropriate skill sets to dominate global commerce for over a century. Gunport, circa 1500. Naval guns and supporting equipment are extremely heavy, and storing them on the deck not only created extreme safety hazards, but also often caused ships to founder. Consequently, it was rare for any vessel to have more than a handful of guns, which could only be stationed on the prow. The gun port allowed the guns to be stored and fired from below decks. This lowered a ship's center of gravity considerably, making it far easier to avoid capsizing while keeping the guns at a remove from potential borders. You could just close the port. It also allowed guns to be mounted all along the side of the ship, increasing the potential firepower of a vessel by a factor of 20 and allowing a single ship to ruin almost anyone's day. Nearly all of these technologies were developed, refined, and operationalized by two countries that had almost nothing to do with the Ottomans. Europe's westernmost peninsula is Iberia. At the time of the Ottoman rise, the peoples of Iberia, the Portuguese and Spanish, had very little going for them. Nearly alone among the major European regions, Iberia has no rivers of meaningful length and only very narrow coastal strips, forcing most of its people to live in a series of elevated valleys. Unsurprisingly, in the 1300s, Iberia was Europe's poorest region. It also didn't help that the two had borne the brunt of the Arab invasion, being occupied by the Moors for nearly seven centuries. But it wasn't their poverty or history that induced them to turn the page of technological history. It was their location. Being at the far western end of the continent meant that the Iberians had to recruit additional middlemen, typically either the French government or Italian traders, to access the spice trade. The additional step pushed up the price even more, not to mention making their spice supplies beholden to the politics of often hostile powers. They had a stark choice to make. Suffer on as Europe's laggards, or devise a means of changing the game. They needed to find a way to bypass the Ottomans, bypass the Italians, bypass the pirates, bypass the known world in its entirety. Their solution was deep water navigation. The newfound reach allowed Spain to break across the Atlantic and dominate the Western Hemisphere without competition. American gold and silver played the central role in Spain's rise to become the most powerful of the Western European empires. Their application of that military power proved critical in undoing the Ottoman position. Spanish forays into the Apennine Peninsula, contemporary Italy, resulted not just in the occupation of the southern and western portions of the peninsula breaking Ottoman control over the Mediterranean, Spain also put a portion of its long-arm navy permanently on station in the western Mediterranean. The Ottomans, still using pre-deepwater ships, had to downgrade their naval tactics to mere privateering. The Turks found themselves forced to divert massive resources from their Danube campaigns to an increasingly failed effort to defend their Mediterranean assets, most notably the Egyptian breadbasket. But as potent as Spain was in challenging the Ottoman position, it was tiny Portugal that upended it. Until Portugal's arrival in South Asia, local oceanic shipping, including the maritime arms of the spice trade that the Ottomans controlled, was purely coastal, sailing with the monsoon winds. East in May and June, west in August. Winds offshore may have blown year-round, but they were erratic, and local ships couldn't reliably navigate or survive the turbulence. The Portuguese deepwater craft, in contrast, found navigating the Indian Ocean to be child's play. Portuguese vessels were able to eviscerate the Ottoman connections to the Asian spice world and then directly occupy key spice production locations via its ships redirecting the trade in its entirety to Lisbon. Even with the military cost of maintaining a transcontinental empire and the 
thousand mile round trips factored in, the price of spices in Portugal dropped by 90%. The Silk Road and its Ottoman terminus lost cohesion, and the robust income stream that had helped make the Ottoman Empire the big kid on the block simply stopped, all because of the ambitions of a country less than one-twelfth its size. In one brief century, the 16th, Iberia shot forward from being Europe's laggards to its leading economic and military powers. But like the Turks before them, the Iberians' very success set events into motion that would strip them of their empires and wealth. Unlike geography, technology can move, and it keeps moving until it settles in a geography that can make the best use of it. Just as agriculture didn't remain hidden in Egypt, the deep-water technologies that allowed the Iberians to overturn Ottoman power diffused out of far western Europe. It should come as no surprise that in time the deep-water technologies diffused from the previously land-bound Iberians to a people who are already quite at home on the water. Deepwater Navigation 2 – England's Rise since they were islanders, it shouldn't come as a major shock that a good portion of the English knew their way around a boat. But what truly set the English apart from Europe's many other maritime cultures was the body of water those boats had to deal with. The bulk of English life resides in the southeastern quadrant of Great Britain, in the general vicinity of the Thames River. The Thames provided all of the unification and local trade opportunities of Europe's other rivers, but it empties into the North Sea, one of the world's most dangerous bodies of water, frigid, tidal extreme, and storm-wracked. There is no day where you dare bring your B-game on the North Sea. As the Spanish discovered in 1588 when it wrecked over half their armada in their failed invasion of England. The severity of the North Sea is the quintessential example of why it took so long for humans to master the oceans, and it was in this crucible that the English naval tradition was forged. Navies offer a flexibility that no land-bound powers can match, and their especially skilled and potent navy gave the English an unmatched advantage in the European competition for supremacy. England's maritime acumen enabled it to nimbly switch trade partners at will, keeping it an economic step ahead of all competitors. Its navy let it land forces at the times and places of its choosing, keeping it a military step ahead of all competitors and its ability to easily relocate military and economic pressure made it the ally of choice for any European power that it was not currently in conflict with. And that was before the English learned the Iberian secrets of deepwater navigation. With deepwater technologies, England leveraged its superior maritime acumen onto the global stage. Bit by bit, the better-skilled English navy reached out across the world and seized control of the Iberian trade network. Between 1600 and 1800, South Asia and the Far East were removed forcibly from the Portuguese sphere of influence. English colonies steadily supplanted their competitors at key locations in Gambia, Nigeria, South Africa, Diego Garcia, India, Singapore, and Hong Kong, relegating the time of Portuguese greatness to history. The faster and more maneuverable vessels of the English allowed them to raid deep into the Caribbean while denying the Spanish treasure fleets the safety of the open seas leaving the Spanish with no choice but to put their coastal colonies on security lockdown and to assign naval assets to protect convoys. It quickly became obvious that the only locations the Spanish would be able to derive long-term income from were those that they had directly colonized with populations sufficient to resist English attacks. In response, the English founded a series of their own colonies in the New World to start the ball rolling on a demographic overthrow of Spanish power in the Western Hemisphere. The most lasting impact of the Deepwater Revolution, however, wasn't the shifting of the spice trade, the fall of the Ottomans, or even the rise of the English or British Empire. It was the transformation of the ocean from a death sentence to a sort of giant river. Deepwater navigation cracked the world open, launching the Age of Discovery, which in turn condensed the world both culturally and economically. Ships capable of making round-the-world voyages made every significant culture aware of the others. Those ships' cargo capacity enabled every previously sequestered river valley to trade with all of the others. Interaction, whether peaceful or hostile, trade or war, was no longer local, but global. It was an age custom-built for a culture as maritime-oriented as the English, 
and they crafted an empire greater in reach or wealth than any that preceded them. They emerged as the dominant global power, able to impose economic and military realities on cultures as varied as northern Europe, southern China, the Indian subcontinent, and throughout the Arab world. Just as the Ottomans had done before them, the English seemed likely to extend their mastery of the seas and globe-spanning empire into something permanent. But they failed, too. Just as with sedentary agriculture and deep-water navigation, a new suite of technologies changed the rules of how the world worked. Ironically, the technologies that ended English dominance were homegrown. As an island nation, the English didn't have need for as potent an army as the mainland empires, so the crown of England was not as absolute as the Iberian monarchies. There were many interests, political, economic, and even military, that coexisted with the government. When the time came for the English to start challenging the Iberian imperial systems, state assets alone were insufficient to the task. The crown had to mobilize not just its own forces, but the forces of its various aristocrats and businessmen as well. Royal dispensation was granted to a variety of private players, the most famous of which was the East India Company, launched in 1600, to pursue various interests for the greater good of the English nation. When the profits from English successes started flooding home, they didn't just go to the royal coffers, but also found their way into the pockets of any number of stakeholders, and each used the newfound financial resources in his own way. Unlike the Iberian monarchs, the English businessmen saw more in the wider world than just spices and precious metals. They also saw bottomless markets. The English system, therefore, didn't seek just simple plunder but also to develop a global trade system with England at the center. Unlike deep-water navigation, which developed in response to the economic need, industrialization was an outgrowth of opportunity. The diverse interests of the English system, the sudden and continuous onrush of wealth that came from the expanding empire, and the still-building shift from superstition and tradition to reasoning and scientific inquiry that began with the Renaissance, led to a new sort of technological revolution an industrial revolution. Industrialization 1. Manufacturing a New World In the pre-industrial world, everything had to be powered by muscle, wind, or water. That is a trifecta of restrictions on the human condition. Work could only be done where there was muscle, wind, or water to be had, and then only to the degree that the muscle, wind, or water could support it. Most important, you couldn't just import muscle, wind, or water to a location that had none. A civilization wouldn't take root or flourish without being able to support a population of sufficient size. That largely eliminated desert, steppe, jungle, and mountain climates from approaching the degree of wealth and development that the Europeans had achieved. Deepwater navigation vastly reduced long-haul transport costs and allowed the European empires to nibble at the edges of this problem a bit. But at the end of the day, it was still a contest between areas with easily navigable waterways. The world's marginal lands, which is to say most of the rest of the planet, remained as undeveloped and untamed as ever. Industrialization technologies brought with them the potential to change all that. Steam and Coal In fits and starts over the 18th century, steam began displacing muscle, wind, and water as the primary means of power. The first successful modern steam engine was introduced as early as 1712 by Thomas Savory to pump water out of coal mines, thus allowing for deeper excavation. In many ways, the first steam engine was a self-powering technology both literally and developmentally. The more powerful and reliable the steam pump was, the more coal could be produced, which lowered the cost of coal to power it. During the course of the century, the steam engine became more powerful, more reliable, and eventually smaller, and thus more mobile. Coal availability was key at every stage. Unlike wind and water, coal was a solid object that could produce useful energy far from its point of extraction. And unlike muscle, it wasn't particularly picky about the quality of lodgings or food during the trip. The increased accessibility of coal made it suited for developments in power, smelting, and ultimately transport. In all cases, though, the magic year was 1805. Industry breakthroughs in the 1780s had matured sufficiently that steel became available in high enough volumes and strength to be used to build railroads and steel ships. Steam engines became small and powerful enough to power steel vessels and railway locomotives. Steamships made navigation, deep water or rivering, 
faster, more versatile, and more cost-efficient by breaking the link between seasonal winds and shipping. Applying industrial construction techniques to rivers themselves allowed bigger locks so that larger ships could reach deeper inland. Railroads allowed the construction of a sort of artificial waterway between fixed points. Places that didn't have the natural benefit of rivers or good port locations could now be inland or dry ports. Constructing a mile track is roughly the same cost as constructing a mile of multi-lane road, but the combined operating and locomotion costs of rail systems are less than a quarter those of roadways. That's still double the cost of maritime operations, but unlike rivers, rail lines could be built and thus serve as powerful economic engines anywhere flat enough to support rail traffic. Traffic times compressed from weeks and months to hours and days. Chemicals The two major breakthroughs in this area were methods of mass-producing sulfuric acid, 1746, and sodium carbonate, 1791. The precursor materials for everything from glass, dyes, toothpaste, and washing detergent to steel, paper, medications, and fertilizer. In the early decades of the Industrial Revolution, it was this last item that proved most critical. Just as coal enabled energy to be applied far from a horse's ass, fertilizers enabled farms to be more productive. If the farm was on already productive land, this was nice to have. But if the farm was on marginal lands, a true revolution occurred. Land under cultivation expanded dramatically, even as the output of the average acre increased. Between fertilizers and better transport options, Food could be produced in far greater quantities and be shipped far greater distances with only a fraction of the labor previously required. The far higher per acre outputs allowed many farmers to relocate to the cities, providing industry with an ever larger pool of labor. Another chemical breakthrough, the development of cheap, strong cements in the 1820s, reinforced with steel, allowed for the hallmarks of modernity that we are all familiar with today. Multi-story buildings, bridges, high-capacity roadways, and city-scale sewers. Between the new food supplies and the new construction techniques, cities needed not be famine-ridden disease incubators. Their sizes exploded. By 1825, London was the world's largest city. Interchangeable parts. Until 1700, all of the pieces of any advanced manufacturer, such as a musket or watch, were typically constructed by the same professional. Such components were crafted and assembled one painstaking piece at a time by highly skilled labor, and had to be repaired in the same manner. During the 18th century, higher degrees of engineering precision developed interchangeable parts, and in the early 19th century, the invention and manufacture of machine tools, everything from lathes to planers to millers, allowed that precision in engineering to be applied to almost every industry. These innovations decreased the need for skilled labor, and by the early 1800s the first assembly lines had appeared. The durability of finished goods drastically increased because anyone with a part could repair most items instead of having to put it into the hands of a skilled craftsman. Output, quality, and worker productivity all expanded by an order of magnitude in the production of everything from textiles to artillery. Between deep water navigation and industrialization, the tyranny of distance had been broken and the impact on trade was dramatic. Output expanded well beyond the ability of the local populace to absorb it. Had the Industrial Revolution happened anywhere else on the planet, there would have been a market crash as the prices of goods would have cratered due to insufficient demand. But at the time the British, as the English became known after their union with Scotland in 1707, were masters of the oceans, ruling a vast military and commercial empire that spanned the globe. This allowed them to shove all of their massive excess production down the throats of any people that they could access via water, particularly within their own empire. The British were easily able to cover all of the administrative costs of their empire, the capital costs of their industry, and have huge additional streams left over to justify both a stronger navy and more industrial development. Just as deep water navigation guaranteed the Spanish a period of overwhelming superiority in the European power game, industrialization enhanced English prominence to the point of making it the clear European hegemon. But though Great Britain was a geography better suited to leverage deep water navigation than Iberia, it was not the ultimate European geography for industrialization. Industrialization requires large volumes of capital to build the industrial base and educate the labor. 
and then obviously large volumes of labor to work the industrial base. The English had the capital, but most of it was now imperially rather than locally sourced. And England still was at most a mid-sized population. English success was linked to their empire, and while it is sexy to say that the sun never set on that empire, the logistics and supply chains of a system that stretches around the world but is managed by less than 1.5% of its population were always going to be unwieldy and temporary. Just as deep water technologies migrated from Iberia to a geography that could utilize them better, so too did industrialization. By 1850, it was Germany's time to rise. The German Pressure Cooker Berlin is perhaps the best located city on the planet from a purely economic point of view. It sits at the junction of the Spree and Havel rivers, both navigable tributaries of the Elbe. Berlin is only 60 miles from the Oder, and the Havel reaches so far to the east as to almost connect the two river basins. This grants Berlin access to one of the world's very few maritime systems that taps into more than one river. And those are just the rivers immediately proximate to Berlin. Close to the west is the Rhine, northern Europe's financial industrial powerhouse, navigable all the way south to the Swiss city of Basel, and possessing tributaries and distributaries that spiderweb through German, French, and Dutch lands. Close to the east is the Vistula, the last major navigable river before the Eurasian Hordlands. Close to the south is the Danube, the longest river in Europe as a whole, one of the very few that flows southward, and the only one mighty enough to punch through the Alps and Carpathians. Any economic hub centered at Berlin is uniquely situated to reach almost anywhere in Europe where wealth can be created. Berlin's waterways dictate that Germany emerge as the heart of a massive empire with economic links to the North, Baltic, and Black Seas, so long as Berlin is left to develop. But Germany has almost never been left to develop. Germany's location saddles it with three critical weaknesses that make it an insecure and often poorer country, despite what ostensibly seems like the geography that most peoples could only dream of. First, Germans don't live at the western end of the continent like the Spanish or on an island like the English. They are in the very middle of the North European plain. While Germany's wealth potential is massive, German lands are inherently vulnerable. To the east is a nigh indefensible border with Poland, whose own eastern border is even less defensible. Germany's western border is similarly difficult. Opposite it is France, typically the most consolidated European power. Balkan upstarts often seethe on the other side of the Vienna Gap, while maritime powers can easily harass and at times even hold portions of the region's lengthy coastline. Being in the middle of the North European plain, has made German lands the primary battleground for European dominance as long as the concept of Europe has existed. The Germans directly border six other nationalities, Poles, Czechs, Swiss, French, Dutch, and Danes. Nearby are the English, Norwegians, Swedes, Lithuanians, Russians, Hungarians, and Italians. In terms of proximity to and magnitude of their rivals, the Germans are in the most difficult strategic environment anywhere on earth. Second, this man-in-the-middle position means that Germany has almost never been united. German rivers lead in different directions to different seas, making different cities look to different horizons for their economic well-being. The middle of Germany, the Harz Mountains region, is akin to having Appalachia between Boston and New York. The presence of not one, but six major powers in immediate proximity long denied Berlin easy control not just of its borderlands, but large tracts of its interior as well, including most of the Rhine and Oder river systems, unlike the English, who established a centralized government in the Thames Valley as early as the 10th century. The initial German proto-state of Brandenburg didn't start stabilizing as a country in its own right until the 15th century. Third, Brandenburg didn't even have the geographic characteristics that would suggest it would be able to build a successful state. Whether you are producing wheat, textiles, or cars, distance is the key in determining your levels of income. The greater your commercial reach, the better you are at connecting your high supplies to someone else's high demands. Put another way, French wine is financially accessible in next door Belgium, but in Chile it is for special occasions only. The Germans lacked independent access to the ocean. 
Germany didn't control even one of its major rivers' delta cities until 1720, when it finally seized Stettin on the Oder from the Swedish Empire. Even then, German ocean access was sharply circumscribed. The Danish island of Zealand is positioned perfectly to regulate traffic between the Baltic and North Seas. Germans only got their first full access to the ocean in 1871, when Berlin finally proved able to fold Hamburg on the Elbe Delta into the German Empire. While the rest of Europe was enjoying an economic boom from the expansion and reach that deep water navigation provided as early as 1700, 1600 for Iberia, the Germans remained dependent upon expensive roads for transport, keeping them locked into pre-deep water levels of economic development. Industrialization changed that. For the Germans, industrialization changed everything. Industrialization 2. The German Juggernaut Geography does more than simply shape balance of power struggles and the flavor of the local economy. It influences cultures as well. Germany's geographic shortcomings molded German development in unique ways. Local government. If the patchwork nature of political borders and the non-unified nature of Central Europe's rivers kept Berlin from being readily reached for consultation, as was so often the case, then local authorities had to learn to act autonomously. They had no choice but to marshal their own resources, financial, labor, technical, and even military. In a world in which your country had perhaps one-fifth the strength of its competitors, and your city boasted perhaps one-hundredth the strength of an immediately neighboring empire like Austria, total talent capture was a prerequisite to survival. 